Hi, good evening everyone. Um, welcome, welcome. So I'm Jess Robinson um, and I'm the Education Program Manager for the Savannah Institute and um, I'm going to go ahead and get things started. So for those of you who don't know what the Savannah Institute is or what we do, um, the Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization that works in collaboration with farmers and scientists to develop perennial food and fodder crops with diverse multifunctional systems grounded in ecology and inspired by the Savannah biome. I am beyond excited and honored to introduce our speaker for tonight, Leah Penniman. Leah Penniman is a black Creole educator and farmer, author, and food act justice activist from Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York. She co-founded Soul Fire Farm in 2011 with the mission to end racism in the food system and reclaim our ancestral connection to land. She is the author of Farming While Black, the first comprehensive manual for African heritage people ready to reclaim the rightful place of dignified agency in the food system. Talk Black Agroforestry from Hayden Laku of Haiti to Faya Ju of Kenya. Leah will discuss how black farmers have innovated agroecological systems for millennia. Um, so learn how farmers at Soul Fire Farm and their sibling organizations are implementing and honoring these practices. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over so that she can present. Give me just a second. Greetings, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Wonderful. And you can see my screen. We're good? Yep. Okay. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, this is Leah from Soul Fire Farm in the usually snowy, rugged mountains of upstate New York, but spring has finally come to us, and it's, it's an honor to be here to talk with you about one of my life's passions, which is agroforestry rooted in the black agrarian tradition. And I want to start out in a way that is traditional to us as African heritage people, which is with the honoring of our ancestors. Um, I particularly want to call into this space and shout out my grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. Um, her name is Susie Boyd. And she, like so many women living in the Dahomey region of West Africa in the 1700s, were witnessing their family members being kidnapped and snatched up and uh, forced into ships brought to an uncertain future. And they certainly fought back, they fled, they fortified themselves. But when it became clear that it was likely that they too would be captured, they gathered up their okra, and cotton, black-eyed pea, eggplant, black rice, sorrel, basil, seeds that they'd been saving for generations and braided those seeds into their hair and the hair of their children, uh, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on soil and believing that we, their descendants, would exist. Uh, so my prayer in this moment is that all the words that are uttered from my mouth and the work of my hands is an honor to carrying on the legacy of that seed, as well as many of the practices um, with perennials, with agroforestry, with the annuals mixed in there, you know, that our ancestors used. And shout out to my sister Naima Penniman for this beautiful painting honoring that moment of braiding the seeds into the hair. Um, I also want to just give a quick shout out to my team at Soul Fire Farm. Uh, we are a community farm. Uh, there are eight of us who work here. Half of us are full-time year-round. The other half are part-time seasonal. And, uh, you know, it's a we thing. Nothing can be done by an individual. And I'm really grateful for all the work that our team puts in so that I can do things like storytell with you all. So shout out to them. And I just want to give you a little bit of information and context about Soul Fire Farm before jumping into the history and context for black agroforestry. Um, this picture that you see here is a typical summer CSA share. Uh, so what we do is we, we have 80 acres of land that we take care of here on ancestral Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory. 
and we use Afro-Indigenous growing methods for our perennials, annuals, and chickens on pasture. And all that food gets boxed up every week and brought to the doorsteps of the people who need it most in our community. Uh, we use a subscription pro program called, we call it Ujamaa Farm Share. You might know it as a CSA, uh, which does come out of the Black Agrarian tradition. The idea of a CSA is credit to Booker T. Watley of Tuskegee, Tuskegee University in Alabama. Um, but we make sure that people pay only what they can afford for the food. Um, and we accept uh, SNAP EBT, as I mentioned, at doorstep. And folks who are refugees, immigrants, or returning from incarceration are getting a free share box that's paid for by their neighbors. So that's really powerful. And this is um, my son posing in front of our sort of creepy white band that does the deliveries, made slightly less creepy by this cool full fire farm sticker on the side. Um, so this is one of the neighborhoods in Troy, a historically redlined neighborhood, an impoverished neighborhood, a neighborhood under food apartheid where diabetes and heart disease and obesity are rampant. Um, and this is where we're bringing the food. Um, the second major thing that we do at Soul Fire Farm is train the next generation of black and brown farmers. Uh, we offer programs in English and Spanish. We offer programs mostly that are residential, week-long programs, but we also have season-long apprenticeships. Uh, we, we work with youth, we work with elders, everyone in between, and we teach folks, uh, you know, seed to harvest to marketing, both the, the physical sort of components that go into farming as well as the uh, business and habits of mind that go into farming. Um, and, and most importantly, how to look super fly while hanging your onions in the barn. Um, so this is one of our programs and a, group, a bunch of participants who are, are learning about harvest and curing. And then the, the third and final major thing that we do at Soul Fire is around organizing. So as folks probably know, the food system is pretty unfair right now um, in terms of who owns the land. It's, it's very skewed towards one demographic group. Um, it is pretty unfair in terms of who gets to eat good food. You know, depending on the color of your skin and your zip code, you're more or less likely to have a supermarket or anything good to eat in your neighborhood. And, and it's really, really unfair in terms of how we treat farm workers um, who don't share the same protections under the law. And so we do a lot of policy work to uh, try to shift those unfair laws and to encourage the citizenry to uh, make consumer choices that are in line with our values. You know, and this organizing work is both within the United States and beyond the borders. These are some farmers in Haiti that we work with regularly. Um, Haiti is my maternal homeland, and this is a seed keepers collective. They grow primarily mangoes and peanuts. And so here they are exchanging the, the peanut seed. Um, and it's a project that we help support. Uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit of context about Soul Fire. Um, I, we have been around, we've been open since the fall of 2010. We were able to um, be chosen by this land in 2006. So it's been a long road here, you know, and it's my passion, it's my love, and the perennials on the farm are my focal point. So I run the education programming and take care of the perennials, and then there's some other farmers that take care of the annuals. So I'm super excited to talk to you about how that work is informed by the black agrarian tradition. So, without further ado, um, I will I will start with the soil because, as we all know, as earth stewards and farmers, we really can't talk about what um, what kind of plants we're going to grow or what that intercrop is going to look like without paying attention to the soil. And in my hands, in this picture on the left, is the soil that we found on our farm back in 2006. And we encountered the land, um, this hard pan clay, very, very shallow topsoil, severely eroded. And then in my right hand in this image is the uh, lush, uh, hot, carbon-rich soil that I gathered in 2018 from some of our farm beds. And you can see visually the difference. And, and what is so special to, to me about this is that our soil is ranked very, very low in the USDA classification of soils. Um, farmers in the valley below us said there's no way you can grow good vegetables or good trees or anything on that soil. And we uh, used Afro-Indigenous methods to improve the soil over time uh, to get to where it is now, you know, going from 2% organic matter to 12% and so on. 
And some of those methods that we use include the way that we test for soil. Um, so in Africa, across Africa, farmers have developed very sophisticated classification systems uh, based on the productive capacity of soils and by examining color, texture, density, and taste. Uh, so for example, you can use your tongue to determine whether a, a soil has a low pH, so it's acidic, and it will have a sour taste, or whether it is more basic, um, and it will have a sweeter taste. And so I have not perfected this. I've definitely tried. Um, but probably more familiar to folks on this webinar is texture by feel. Like, I imagine you've probably, you know, formally or informally rubbed a ball of soil between your fingers to see, uh, you know, whether it can form a ribbon, how gritty or smooth it feels. And that comes out of a farmer's uh, the Yoruba people in Nigeria who classify soils based on texture as yanrin, sandy, bole, clay, or aladun, lomi, um, as well as all of the derivatives thereof, of, like bole, aladun, lomi, clay, and so forth. Um, and Western scientists have gone and checked out these soil testing methods and been like, oh my goodness, how can it be? You know, they align and are sometimes even more sophisticated than what we've come up with. So we give a shout out to African farmers for helping us understand soil. When we talk about building up soil, healing soil, repairing soil, um, one of our most fierce and valuable accomplices is the earthworm. Um, and there's a picture of Cleopatra up here because she had a very high regard for earthworms. She knew that their castings were rich and fertile. So she made a law that if you harmed an earthworm, you would be put to death. And she had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time study was dedicated to the habits of earthworms. So, you know, USDA researchers have gone over to Egypt and checked out, using soil cores, what that soil was like in, you know, 30 to 69 BCE and found that um, the worm castings were about 120 tons per acre, which is 10 times the amount of castings in the Midwest of the United States um, in that time period. And so it's really profound that Cleopatra introduced this idea of sheet vermicomposting to the world and deliberately encouraging earthworm habitat in order to uh, augment soil organic matter. Another way that um, black farmers have contributed to uh, the way that we think about building up soil is through uh, what is called African dark earth. So African dark earth is a very dark and fertile um, anthropogenic soil that was invented by women in Ghana and Liberia, um, documented at least 700 years old, uh, probably older. And it involves the combination of different types of waste. So ash and char residues from cooking, uh, bones from food preparation, byproducts from processing palm oil and soap, harvest res residues, kitchen scraps, and so forth. And it is combined just right. It has a super high concentration of calcium and phosphorus. Uh, it's alkaline, so it limes the soil, and it holds about three times as much organic carbon as other soils. Uh, what I love most about African dark earth is that it's so pervasively made in Ghana. Um, that you, the elders in the community, can measure the age of their towns by the depth of this black soil, since every farmer in every generation has participated uh, in its creation. Another way that African farmers has helped us think about soil care um, is through something called Swidden agriculture. And I know this photo may look sort of alarming because we've been so taught to demonize uh, what's usually referred to as slash and burn. Um, but in fact, uh, what makes so-called slash and burn, burn so um, unsustainable in the public eye is, is colonization. And so I'll explain this. In pre-colonization uh, across the world, farmers were able to develop generation-long crop rotations where the forest was the cover crop. And so you'd burn an area of the land um, release all those nutrients, plant whatever you need to plant in there, you know, graze your animals and so forth. And after a couple of years, when the soil was tired, you move on to a new place. There is so much available land that that rotation would not land you back on that original spot for 20 to 30 years. 
And in that amount of time, a forest develops. And as we all know, as lovers of the forest, um, you know, the deep roots of trees are able to pull up minerals that aren't available in the upper layers. Uh, you get underground carbon storage that is relatively stable uh, because that root biomass doesn't go anywhere, even if you are cultivating the top layer. Uh, you're getting the organic litter all over the top of the soil and so forth. What happened is with European colonization, the best land was taken. Indigenous people all across the world were forced into smaller and smaller spaces, uh, but maintained this practice of foot in agriculture and with rotations reduced to sometimes just two or three or four years, becomes unsustainable because you don't get the woody cover. You only get um, some scrappy annuals growing, uh, which don't have the same benefits. And eventually that soil is destroyed over time. Uh, but this original idea is sound and um, does sequester much more carbon than it releases and is the predecessor to all of our understanding of crop rotation. So getting on a little bit more to, you know, beyond the soil into what is planted and how it's planted um, in terms of African agroforestry, what you're looking at in this picture is a nursery. Uh, this is in Haiti, again, my maternal homeland, in a little community called Bigone Leogan. And the mango growers set up this beautiful nursery, and it has plants that go into a system that we call jardin la cou, or courtyard garden, or house garden. So this is the primary agroforestry system in Haiti. Um, every house has one, every compo uh, compound has one, and the trees are the center point, and so sometimes it's moringa, uh, mango, lemon trees, many different types of trees. And then around the trees are herbs and vegetables are planted. Uh, the livestock graze within these jardin la cou to provide manure for fertilization. Uh, kitchen waste are composted to enrich the soil. And then all of it is uh, fenced in with a uh, cactus uh, living fence. And so there are many, many, many different polycultures that can go into um, the Jardin La Cou. Um, and we experiment with a lot. Unfortunately, most of the crops do not grow in New York as much as I wish that we could have moringa and lemon trees and uh, cereza and so forth. You know, we have to have our own adaptations. And so this is here at Soul Fire Farm. This is one version of a Jardin La Cou that we're trying to make with uh, locally appropriate crops. Um, and there's a couple technologies going on here. Uh, one is a Kenyan technology called Fanya Ju. So Fanya Ju literally translates in Kiswahili as throw it upwards. Because, of course, if you're on sloped land over time, the soil will erode down the hill. And so in order to build your terraces, you need to throw it upwards. Fanya Ju, you throw the soil up, uh, put a barrier in place, create these stair steps. And that is how agroforestry is done um, in many parts of East Africa and, of course, around the world. Uh, so here we have our apple trees, um, which are fenced in for burden protection. These are, these are young trees. And then around the trees, we have um, go, now it's, it's fully developed, but in this picture it's yet to be planted, uh, about 20 different species of perennial herbs. Among them, some of them that we're excited about are the chives, uh, which are in the allium family. They attract pollinating insects, discourage burrowing animals, and repel um, harmful pest insects. Uh, we grow sage, which is a beautiful ground cover. Its aroma is also pest deterrent. Uh, a bunch of mint and lemon balm, uh, which uh, are insect repellents and can deter mosquitoes as well, the citronella and the lemon balm. Uh, we plant comfrey among this Jardin La Cou, which is a dynamic nutrient accumulator. It mines the subsoil for minerals and brings them to the surface to improve the topsoil. Um, and then we cut it back several times in the season to mulch around the trees. Uh, and then we have a lot of herbs that, you know, attract pollinators, but more so we grow them just because they're uh, helpful for our human community, our chamomile, echinacea, bee balm, arnica, skullcap, and many other medicinal herbs in the understory of the um, the apple. So again, we're using the structure of both the Fanya Ju, which is an East African technology, as well as the uh, intercrop strategy of the Jardin La Cou in Haiti, but substituting in crops that grow in our area. 
And here is um, the mature chamomile, which we're harvesting. Um, and I think it's important to note, yeah, it's important to note that, you know, we really, it's not just a belief. Science has confirmed what I think we have intuited, that the forest is a superorganism, right? And so trees literally talk to each other using this internet of fungal mycelium. They can send warnings, they can share carbon and minerals, they can take turns helping each other out when environmental conditions are rough. Um, so this is both a spiritual um, symbol of cooperation that, that can help us know how to behave in a human community. Um, but it's also a very practical survival strategy that we can tap into. So one thing I love about the agroforestry that I've learned in the Caribbean is that you always think about how do you connect your system to the uh, forest itself so that your agroforestry system can be part of that network. So encouraging fungal dominance through uh, wood chips and leaves from the forest, you know, going into the forest, gathering up healthy leaves and making a pour in or, you know, a, a tea, essentially a spray that brings some of those beneficial organisms from the forest into um, the agroforestry system. Uh, is one way to encourage our our human created intercrops to be part of nature created intercrops. And I just want to point out too that the idea of moving beyond monoculture extends beyond perennials. Um, so I've studied farming in Ghana, West Africa, in Haiti, uh, in Vieques, Puerto Rico, uh, some other members of our in Mexico, other members of our team have spent time in Brazil. And just as the Jazen Lacour, the Fania Ju, are these intercrops of trees and perennials, all crops are uh, worked with in polycultures. So, for example, the House of Farmers of Nigeria alone, so this is one ethnic group in one country, have developed 156 crop combinations um, that include different no-till polycultures of grains and legumes and roots. Uh, root crops planted on these different ridges. So, for example, the yams on top of the mounds, the rice in the furrow, um, and then on the lower parts of the mound, the maize, okra, melon, and cassava. You know, in between you have a goosey melon with sorghum, cassava, coffee trees, cotton, and banana trees. So the, the ground, you know, becomes totally blanketed with uh, food crops and weeds are suppressed. Another way that African farmers uh, practice Polyculture is through relay cropping. So that's relay cropping is when a second crop is planted after the first crop is well established but still immature. So for example, um, maize can be established and starting to grow and then in between you could seed uh, cow peas and ground nuts. So that cow peas deep taproot will mine the soil for water and nutrients and then climb up the stalks of the maize. Um, of course, legumes are nitrogen fixing. Uh, so they're going to provide that nitrogen for the maize and also uh, provide shade which conserves moisture and so forth. This may sound really familiar. Um, most of us hopefully have heard of the Greek sisters, which is a Turtle Island indigenous practice of corn, beans, and squash um, called milpa in Mexico. And, and it is interesting and important to note that this idea of the intercrop between the legume and maize uh, co-originated and co-evolved um, in West Africa. Uh, as well. Another example of polyculture, so in Ghana, farmers are specialized in intermixing their fruit trees with their vegetables. Uh, so it's very common to have a citrus tree and then below the citrus tree there's pigeon peas, sweet potatoes, platinas, cocoa yams, um, or to have uh, native timber species together with mangoes and then below that have your sweet potatoes, your cassava, cashew, groundnut, um, and so forth. So all across Ghana, you'll see these polycultures. Oh, and here's, sorry, I didn't change the slide. So here's one, this is a, a Ghanaian farmer showing off the beautiful uh, multi-story intercrop. Uh, also, so just as perennials are integrated and annuals are integrated, so is livestock. Uh, here we have, this is at our farm, a soul fire farm, where we do rotational grazing of chickens. Uh, the oldest livestock known to human beings is the guinea hen. Uh, which originated in Africa. And chickens in particular have a long and strong relationship with black farmers. Um, 
albeit a bit dubious because enslaved Africans were not allowed to own any livestock larger than a chicken, uh, so became specialists in uh, you know, breeding and husbandry and, and rotation. So a lot of the varieties of chickens that we have today and the practices, you know, come out of the work of enslaved Africans. But nonetheless, you know, chickens provide a really high nitrogen manure. Uh, their shelter is small and versatile, and so you can move it between things. And so the way that we've built up fertility in our orchards uh, is to rotationally graze uh, poultry, you know, in between and around the different crops. So we mentioned all these physical technologies, which is super important, but I'll tell you a quick story about why spiritual technology is also essential in African agroforestry. Uh, so one of the times that I was uh, visiting my elders in Ghana, West Africa, uh, the Queen Mothers, they called me into uh, council with them. They called me to speak with them and they said, you know, Leah, is it really true that in the United States a farmer will put a seed in the ground and they will not pray, they will not dance, they will not sing, they will not even, you know, say thank you or pour any libation on the ground and then expect the seed to grow? Um, and of course that, that was true. I told them that was, was pervasive. And they said, that's why you're all sick. You know, you're all sick because you treat the earth as this material thing from which you can extract. Um, without limits and not as the living, breathing or risha that she is, you know, deserving of, of consent and deserving of uh, reciprocity. So here we are honoring in this picture ritual with the earth, giving thanks for the earth. Uh, we have a spring planting ceremony, first seeding ceremony that we just did this past weekend. Um, we have a fall harvest ceremony. Uh, we give thanks. We have ways in our African traditional religion to ask for consent of the land before we do major changes. Uh, and so all of this is uh, part of um, honoring the tradition of agroforestry. So I also want to mention, you know, we have this beautiful, starting with the, the seed braids in the hair, we have this beautiful, long-standing uh, legacy of stewarding the earth as black people and yet uh, black farmers are often not part of these conversations. A lot of people don't even know about these contributions at all. And so I want to mention in brief some of the conditions that prevent the flourishing of black agrarianism to understand why it is that some of this information might be new to folks um, on the call. So the first uh, significant barrier is around land. Um, as I hope we all know by now this whole nation building project here in the United States is predicated on the attempted genocide of indigenous people, uh, land theft, broken treaties. And that started in 1455 with the Papal Decree coming out of the Roman Catholic Church that said that Christian, white Christian nations had the right and blessing of God to go forth and colonize and enslave non-Christian, non-white nations. And that was the beginning of the Age of Discovery. It's what justified slavery and it's what justified the theft of the continent. So you can see in this image, um, Lady Manifest Destiny uh, bringing her, quote, lights, you know, across the plains and driving out the native people and the buffalo. But this isn't over. You know, the Supreme Court has upheld the doctrine of discovery, which essentially says that white settlers have rights to land and indigenous people do not. Uh, the Supreme Court has upheld this many times, first in 1823 in the McIntosh case, and most recently in 2005 when the United Nations sued for some of its ancestral territories and were told that um, you, you do not have rights to your land under the doctrine of discovery. Uh, in the last USDA census in 2012, uh, 98% of the land was owned by white people, which is more racially skewed than ever before in history. So we have a long way to go in terms of land access, and obviously if we don't own land or control land, it's very difficult to have racial justice in terms of farming and food. The second big barrier has to do with how farm labor is treated. Um, the $10 trillion agriculture industry uh, back in the uh, 1600s, 1700s was built upon the stolen labor of black people. Um, but then with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865, it didn't end. 
uh, the, you know, using exploited labor to grow the food for the nation and the other agricultural products. There was a system called convict leasing uh, where a bunch of new laws were created called the Black Codes that criminalized things like loitering, which is hanging around, and vagrancy, which is not having a job, um, as a cover for filling the prisons of black people so they could be leased to the plantations, the mines, and the railroads. Um, this system of convict leasing made up 73% of Alabama's state budget in the late 1860s. Um, after that, uh, sharecropping and tenant farming were the primary ways that the U.S. relied on or found agricultural labor. And then with the flight, uh, the refugee crisis of black people leaving the racism of the South, that labor vacuum was filled with guest workers through the Bracero and H2 and H2A programs. Uh, so we still have a system right now in this country where about 85% of our food is grown by people who are uh, people of color, uh, yet only 2 or 3% of the farms are controlled by, and we don't have labor laws that protect farm workers. Uh, this started in 1935 with the, the original New Deal and all of those labor protections, farm workers and domestic workers were excluded because of their race. Um, and we haven't rectified that yet. Um, so definitely check out the Fairness for Farm Workers Act, which is the first attempt since 1935 to include farm workers in our basic labor laws. And then on the side of the consumer as well, you know, depending on your zip code and the color of your skin, you are more or less likely to live in a system of food apartheid. And a neighborhood under food apartheid does not have grocery stores or farmers markets or community gardens or healthy places to access food. Um, and as a result, there are very high rates of diabetes and heart disease and hunger. Uh, for example, if you're a black child in this country, you have a one in three chance of going to bed hungry tonight. And so um, this impacts the consumer, obviously, but it also impacts our ability to participate in civic life and, and to do things for the benefit of our own communities. Industrial ag is trashing the planet. That's no good <laughs> at all. Um, you know, it's the primary driver of, of climate change, of water withdrawals, and of land mass conversions uh, from natural habitat into human-controlled um, development. And so we know, we absolutely know how to grow food in a way that doesn't trash the planet. That is uh, part of our heritage as Afro-Indigenous people. But that knowledge is usually ignored, or if it's not ignored, it's appropriated, which means that it's stolen and repackaged for the benefit of others and not the community uh, from whom it originated. And then finally, um, and most tender, I think, is the barrier that prevents black agrarianism from flourishing is all the trauma that is invariably inherited. You know, there's no way of going through hundreds of years of land-based oppression, such as slavery and sharecropping and, um, you know, outright violence against landowners. There was over 4,000 black landowners who were killed for the so-called audacity to upset the, the racial caste system. So that trauma means that a lot of black and brown folks, when they encounter land or they see images of farming automatically associated with oppression, with slavery. And you know, as a farmer friend of mine, Chris Bolden Newsom, said, the land was the scene of the crime. But I would add that she wasn't the criminal. You know, she, she was actually probably the source of our uh, resiliency. And a big part of our work is to allow folks to be reintroduced to the land in a culturally safe and relevant way where that trauma can begin to be healed and we can meet the earth again on our own uh, sovereign terms. So my hope, you know, going forth is that in all of your work, in all of our collective work, that we can deepen the ways that we show respect for the black agrarian tradition and black contributions to agroforestry and really honor uh, the beautiful gift that we received in terms of our ancestors braiding seeds and knowledge and wisdom into their hair, uh, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on soil and believing against odds that they would have descendants who needed to inherit that seed and that knowledge. Um, as far as what we can do specifically to help, um, to be able to support a more racially just farming and food system, is first and most importantly to remember that 
those who are harmed by a particular oppression or impacted by a condition are the experts in it. Um, you know, if I want to work on anti-Semitism issues, I'm going to, you know, talk to Jewish people and talk to my synagogue about what I can do. If I want to work on veterans issues, I'm going to, you know, go down to uh, the VA and talk to veterans and see what I can do. And so the same when we're talking about racial justice or black agrarianism, we need to make sure that we're offering resources and time to organizations run by uh, black folks, by people of color and other target identities. Um, to that end, we've created a reparations map, which is this really cool tool where uh, black and brown led farms and projects put up what they need, which ranges from a word of encouragement to a tractor to some land and people who have resources can uh, jump in and offer that support. We can also work on changing policy and we put together, we interviewed over 500 aspiring and current black farmers about what laws and practices need to change for them to thrive and built a take action guide, which you should check out because there's definitely something for everyone there. Um, and we're going to move to questions in just a moment, but I want to say that um, it's been a real honor to get to share these stories with you, and I hope that you follow us, that you stay involved with Soulfire. Our website is soulfirefarm.org, and our social media is Soulfire Farm, as well as Farming While well Black. And we are finishing up, a, we wrote a book um, called Farming While well Black about these practices, and are finishing up a book tour. We have some more stops in North Carolina, um, California, Chicago, and a few other places. So definitely check out our website and see if we overlap with any of your travel plans. And with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. All right. Thank you, Leah, so much for that wonderful talk. It was super informative and touched on some really important points. So I'm really happy that you're able to um, cover this information. And so for people who have questions, um, there are two ways you can ask the questions. You can go ahead and drop the question in the chat box. Um, and I'm also going to open up a, um, a question session where you can ask your question through your mic. So, um, so if you're on the phone and you want to ask a question, go ahead and put star six um, into your phone, and that should allow you to be able to ask your question through, through your phone. Um, and so we have one question already um, from Leah. And so I'll go ahead and allow her to speak. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, can I can hear you. Hold on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Hi, Leah. That was so wonderful. It's so nice to be here. And I've read your book, Farming Well Black. You're amazing. You're epic. Um, my question is, how did you do the research to learn about your ancestors. You told the story of your grandmother's grandmother's grandmother. And I'm curious how we can all do that work to learn more about our ancestry and ancestral practices. Um Leah, I think your mute your mic is muted. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> this is can you hear me? Yeah, I was able to hear you, Leah, but not Leah Penniman. So, oh, the other Leah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, hold on. Give me just a second. Let me make sure I can. Um, Leah, can you hear me? Your your mic is muted, and so we're not able to hear if you're talking. Hold on. Give us just a second. Okay, I think we should be able to hear you now. Oh. Leah, are you there? Oh, okay. I think we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. I think I had to ask a question and then you had to accept me. That was weird. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anyway, I just was saying that I really love that question because I think it makes a, a correct assumption that our work is to dive into our own ancestry and traditions and we don't necessarily have to dive into 
other people's as a first step, um, which can sometimes get into appropriation. So I just applaud the, the question. You know, it's been a journey. I'm a super nerd. I've always been very curious about my family and history and ancestry. So, um, you know, interviewing my great aunt when she was still alive and my grandparents and then going to the places that uh, they told me about and getting to know people and staying a long time and studying. You know, I did a lot of this in and around college years when there was more time. Um, but it was not linear. And I think you pick up one thread and it sort of leads to another thread. And some of it's been filled in by research, too. You know, I get a clue about something like the seed braids, and then I went and hit the anthropological journals and literature to see what had been written about it. And there's, there is quite a bit of, um, you know, Western lens research about uh, the hiding of seeds in hair when people were uh, in the transatlantic slave trade um, and then bringing those seeds over. And so some of my knowledge has been filled out by you know, more typical university type research in addition to talking to family and visiting. All right, great. And we have another question from Antoine Wilson, who's also going to do it through his mic. So I'm going to just go ahead and page them. Hello, can I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is um, just given the fact that it's just something that I, have been struggling with as a black farmer uh, here in America. Um, just how, as black Americans, given the fact that we were brought over here, you know, during slavery and forced to work the land that was initially taken from indigenous people, uh, just wanting to hear your ideas around healing uh, our connection and relationship to the idea of land ownership or acquisition as black people, given the fact that we are working on uh, indigenous Native American land that isn't necessarily our own, but that uh, we have such a intense connection to because of our history. Word. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I didn't know if I needed to press something. So that is, that's so real. I mean, that's like the water that we're swimming in right now. Um, Ed Whitfield, who's one of my mentors, a uh, black co-op developer, former Black Panther, talks about how like the land is bound up with both the people who are the original friends and also the people whose blood has mixed with the soil over generations. And so I resonate with that sense of belonging. Um, and right now we're deep in this project called the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust where we're working on a collaboration with a number of native communities. Um, a couple of folks from the Nipmuc are on the board. We we out with Mohican folks, Abenaki, uh, Scattacoke, to work on collaborating around the return of land um, to indigenous people through a, a thoughtful consultation and consent process as well as to black and brown farmers. And it's not easy because one of the major projects of colonization and white supremacy have been divide and distract. So to try to take those who are oppressed in different ways and get them to spend their time fighting each other instead of fighting the system that hurts us both. So we're going at the pace of trust and working to heal those wounds and really believe that you know, with white people owning 98% of the rural land, there's a real long way to go before we actually need to be at odds with each other. Um, and we'll be more effective together, but we have no easy roadmap for it. But definitely check out uh, northeastfarmersofcolor.org and like reach out. I'm sure Stephanie and Saka, who are the coordinators, would be happy to let you in on some more of that strategy around relationship building and consultation in ways that honor the needs of the black and indigenous communities for belonging to land again um, and belonging to it in a way that's, that's beyond private ownership in a way that is using models like land trusts and land banks and co-ops to uh, be more true to the way that our ancestors understood land belonging. Y'all still there? Hello. 
Hi, I don't know. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Um, so, hi, Leah and everyone on the line. Um, uh, my name is Allison Espinosa, and I am of Puerto Rican and Dominican descent. So, we are neighbors on the paternal side of the Dominican um, with Haiti there. So, um, I'm very excited because of, currently I'm um, acquiring, I'm, I'm buying a home um, upstate New York. So, very similar clay uh, soil to to yourself, Leah. Um, it, and my question is uh, now on that land, there's an acre on the home. I am not a farmer by trade. I'm a veterinary technician, so I kind of <laughs> have some knowledge of animal husbandry, but um, a, a little more on the domestic side. Um, so my question is, is locally to me in the particular area is the Rochester area, so not too far from Albany. Um, but I, in in my area, there's not a whole lot of farmers of color um, at, at all, and I know that's not you know uh, rare and and unheard of. But I'm a little bit hesitant, and I, you mentioned this in your book, and I've been reading your book, um, Farming While Black, and you've mentioned this in your book where people of color were hesitant to kind of work on white farmers' land, and and that's what I'm kind of experiencing myself, knowing where my ancestors come from. Um, that that's sort of a a little bit of a barrier for me in my mind to 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 getting the hands-on experience that I feel like I need in order to work mm. my land more effectively. That's a really good that point. Makes. So first of all, in the Buffalo Rochester corridor, there are a number of black farmers. I was just there two weeks okay. ago. We had an invite-only lunch that was like packed to the brim of black and brown farmers. Some urban, you know, some rural. But if you want to shoot me an email at love at soulfirefarm.org, I can connect you with those folks who might have some okay. ideas and tips in the area. Um, yes, and then I guess the next best thing, which is not anywhere near Rochester, but uh, Farm School NYC has a, a really good program to get folks started. Um, like an eight-month weekends-only program that probably would be worth traveling for if there's nothing right in your area. And I should also mention my sister is moving to Troy, New York, what? and uh, yes, and That's so like she mentioned. From us. <laughs> I, I know. So I was talking to her on the on the phone today, and I said I'm going to to the on this this call, and I'm very excited because I think I am going to go visit you, and we're going to go to Soul Fire together um, for either their immersion once we apply and go through that process, or to go to one of the. Um, you know, days where you guys have it sort of open and we can come and um, get our hands in the dirt. And so that's something that I look forward to doing as well once um, once we get to the area. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to welcoming you. Yeah, and we, as you alluded to, um, but just so that everyone knows, we do have these monthly community farm days that have uh, opportunity to volunteer in the morning and big potluck lunch, tour, hangout time. Uh, so if you check out our website, uh, those are times that are open, and then we have also these programs that you can apply for and learn how to find fun too. So yeah, welcome to New York. I'm excited to have you. Thank you so much. All right, sweet. And we have a question from um, Steve Gabriel as well, so I'm going to go ahead and um, let him speak. All right, Steve, you're, you're free to chat. And ask your question. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Steve, are you there? Okay, this might have been an accidental question asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a we have a question in the chat box. Oh, <laughs> okay. Steve said uh, he didn't mean to raise his hand. <laughs> um, this is totally cool. All right, any more questions, you guys? All right. Um, I actually have a question, Leah. Um, I was just curious to know, um, in terms of agroforestry, kind of what um, are some other like POC-led POC farms doing in regards to agroforestry, and um, if there are any like particular plants that people are really interested in growing, um, and anything like that. Well, that's a great question. Um, I 
don't know if I'm super tapped into it, but I know that uh, Ross Gay, who is a pretty well-known poet, but less well-known uh, orchardist from Indiana, mm. does a whole lot of urban agroforestry stuff in the black community, which is super exciting. So he's definitely somebody to look up. Um, and then there's quite a bit going on in native communities, so in the Haudenosaunee Nation and Aquasasne in particular with people reclaiming uh, native varieties and managing wild spaces so that, uh, you know, they produce sacred and traditional medicines and food and fiber crops. So that's a little bit of what, what I know. Um, I think that there's some excitement right now. I don't know if people know Mama Ira Wallace, but she is a black elder who helped to start the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. Um, and she's been gathering together black seed keepers of both uh, you know, perennial and annual crops to try to figure out how to build a national network to preserve heritage varieties. And it's a very new conversation, but I'm, I'm super excited about it and hopeful that you know, in the coming years there'll be this robust network to, to plug into. But we're at the, those early stages of reclamation right now. Yeah, yeah, the seed saving is <laughs> a really important component. Um, and it was yeah. the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange? So yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, so I just want to thank you so much, Leah, for your time and your energy um, for talking about these really important topics that are also close to my heart as well. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Um, I'll be posting a recording of this talk in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think that's, that's it. And people are saying thank you, thank you very much. Um, so thank you so much, Leah. And um, yeah, we're going to close it up for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful night. Many blessings.